has the concatenation of the username part and the domain part. Why would, you like, why would we want to do this? Well, we know that emails um, have a pretty unique part, the username, but um, uh, the domain part has a very low cardinality. So we have the same domain for a lot of um, email addresses. So if you represent data in this way, then you could apply dictionary compression on the domain. But if we do not split, then we cannot do anything. So this is the opportunity that the, that white box compression creates. Generalized white box compression is a compression model that uses basic operators, chains them together into expression trees to represent the logical columns. So we have on top the logical columns, the one that the user sees. Then we have basic operators, concatenation, map, uh, format. They're chained into an expression tree. And then we have the physical columns. And the purpose of this is that the total size of the physical columns is smaller than the total size of the logical columns. We also have exception columns. Imagine in the email column that we have a value that is not an email, that does not have the add sign, and we cannot split it. Then we need to treat this as an exception. So then for every value that does not match the compression tree, we store that value in the expression column, which is a separate column. This allows recursion. We can compress exception columns exactly as we can compress any other columns. So I hope I gave a clear definition of white box compression. And now let me make the difference between white box and black box compression. Um, it's a difference from the system's uh, perspective. That is, a black box system will take the column as input and would output a block of data with compressed values and exceptions stored there. Um, while white box compression would take a column and would output some other columns. This allows recursion. This is transparent. And we can easily understand what, how, how the data is represented just by looking at the header of the block, which contains the expression tree, as opposed to in black box compression, where we have only an identifier, E4, what does that mean? So this is the difference. Um, but let me exemplify more on a real, again, data, um, and see how white box compression can be used to um, compress this. Maybe you see that these two columns are identical, um, but there's more redundancy here. We see that whenever a column starts with GS, then we can have GSA on the second column, general service administration on the third and fourth column. So this is a pattern here. We can say that we don't need to store these columns if we have this column, because we know that this value gives these three values and these will give the other three values. We only need to store a mapping between these values. So if we were to represent this data through white box compression, it would look like this. We would split the first column into the um, red uh, characters and uh, the last part. The delimiter is the first digit. You see that there's this code and then we have digits. So we represent the first column as a concatenation of the highlighted part and the suffix. And then we represent all the other columns as a mapping of the first column. And what does this give us? This gives us a great compression ratio. I computed the row size as taking the average length of the string and sum it up for uh, the four columns. The, the table has 11 million rows. And it reduces the size from 881 megabytes to 167. I'd say that this is a great opportunity. But there's more compressed execution. 
let's say that the user wants to select the last three columns um, and but, but filter by the first column, uh, only the values that start with uh, GS. Then instead of going through the first column and then reading the last three columns with the new representation, we only need to read the prefix column. So we read the pre prefix column to get the filter, and then we read the prefix column to get the other values by using the mapping. Now, although I show the opportunity for uh, compressive execution, I might mention that this is out of the scope of my thesis, because the project is already complex enough. I will label it as future work, and I focus in my thesis on learning the patterns in the data automatically and automatically generating the compression tree, uh, everything optimized for size. And here comes our last research question, which is the hardest one, which asks us how can we learn all this that we've seen uh, automatically? So imagine you have a sample of the data, you want to obtain a compression tree that will give um, a, the better, a better representation of the data. This is done by first automatically detecting patterns in the data. Um, I defined four actions that we can do, that we can apply on columns, and for each action, I implemented a pattern detector. Let me exemplify. So we can change the data type of a column. This is useful for columns that have a, a suboptimal data type. So I implemented the numeric string pattern detector that searches for numbers in, in the bar chart columns. Then we can split one column in multiple columns. Um, I implemented the character set split and part of the n-gram frequency split. The character set split splits the vats. It is useful for columns like customer number one, customer number two. Uh, it splits column based on the types of characters. So in this case, it will split into letters and digits. But it's flexible, you can input any type of character sets, hexadecimal digits and delimiters and so on and so forth. The n-gram frequency split is useful for emails. It will detect parts of the column that have high frequency and parts of the column that have low frequency. Then we can combine four more columns this is column correlation. We first detect the correlation between columns, and then we create a mapping to represent one column as a function of another. And then there's a cons the consume option that will not store any values, only metadata. For example, a constant column does not even need to be stored. We can only store the constant value and the exceptions. And all these can be done recursively. Now, I'd love to go through all the details of all of these pattern detectors, but I will try to stay in time. And if we have time at the end, or if you want, after presentation, I could explain everything that I did in these pattern detectors. The second step after we detected patterns on individual columns is to combine them and build a compression tree. For this, I define two algorithms. The first one is iterative and greedy. It takes as input an empty compression tree and a set of input columns, the, the logical columns, and then it iterates and it adds one level in the compression tree at a time in each iteration. The decision to of the nodes that are added to the compression tree is made greedily by some pattern selectors that are specialized in different pattern types. Um, this is fast because it does not explore the full space of the problem, uh, but it may not give the best um, compression ratio. Therefore, we defined the exhaustive algorithm that is recursive and uses a cost model uh, that is given by some estimators or 
based for the um, existing compression schemes, like RLE for Dix, uh, which are considered to be leaf columns in the tree. So we we won't compress more of the RLE, and we won't compress four, and then therefore we can estimate the size of the column. So this recursive algorithm is exhaustive. It has a very high complexity, but it will not miss changes to um, to compress better. I didn't implement it yet, but I plan to try it on small tables and see what's the difference between this one and the iterative one. Um, I'll go to evaluation. I use as baseline vector-wise, and we have the following methodology. We have an input data, which is CSV. We load it to vector-wise and we get the compression ratio. Then we take the same input data, you pay, we feed it to the white box uh, compression engine. It will represent the data in a different way without applying uh, leaf compression method, without applying uh, RLE4 and uh, other existing methods. Then it will generate the new representation of the data as a CSV file and we load that data into vectorwise so that it can apply the black box compression methods on it. And then we get another compression ratio. The reason for doing this, as opposed to having white box <coughs> compression as a standalone system, is that it would, so my, comp my compression tree will always end with the black box compression schemes or eventually a white box version of them. <coughs> but the best way in which we can measure the effect of white box compression is to have the same leaf compression uh, uh, schemes. So that's why we, we use vectorwise. But let's take a peek at the results. We see here compression ratios on some tables in the um, public data benchmark. Um, orange is vectorwise, black box compression, green is white box compression and then compressed again with vector wise. So for some tables, white box compression creates a significant difference, like doubles the compression ratio, while for some other tables, it does not. A question. Yes. Each table is only about strings? No, tables contain everything. everything. So this is a polluted, so this does not explicitly show what the benefit is of the white uh, box compression because it's only addressing part of the table. Yes, that is correct. But um, part of the white box compression does not address are compressed in the same way with mm -hmm. as they were compressed in the baseline. Uh, I also have some plots where we only compare the columns that are used. Compressed, yeah. I didn't choose that because I, I thought it would be better to see uh, see it in action on original columns, mm -hmm. original tables. Now the reason for this small improvements are not known yet. I have some options. Maybe there are, there are no compression opportunities there. Maybe data is already well compressed. So if we have some data that will compress with dictionary, but then we apply column correlation on it, we just improve dictionary, which is already super good. Or maybe the greedy algorithm that I, I tested um, is taking local best solutions, lo uh, global optimal solutions. We don't know that. It's, uh, we'll find out soon. Um, I'll finish my master thesis somewhere in August, so I'm still a work in progress here. Um, but there's one specific case. We see that on the last column, we get the, the worst compression ratio. That's a specific uh, table. It has less than one megabyte of data. And um, compression on such a small table does not make sense. So I don't feel that it's a problem having a worse result on uh, such small tables. And the, the main thing that we see here is that even though we don't get better compression ratios, like significantly better compression ratios, we always get at least uh, the compression ratio of vector-wise. So it, we are never uh, worse than black box. 
Um, this being said, uh, let's see if I answered all the research questions. So we've seen what real data looks like by looking at the public data benchmark. We've seen how good are how good are existing compression methods by loading the vector PI benchmark into vector Y. We've seen that we can represent real data more compactly through white box compression, and we showed the compressed vegetation opportunities. And then I defined and implemented automatic learning algorithms that detect patterns in the data and generate compression trees uh, given a sample of data. Um, so I will conclude now. Real data has lots of redundancy. It's already well compressible with black box methods, but there are opportunities in streams. White box compression is not only an improvement on existing methods in terms of uh, size, it's, it's also a different model which simplifies black box compression because it, it allows recursion um, and everything is transparent. Exception columns have, exceptions are not stored in the same block of data, giving the opportunity to um, compress them also. In terms of compression ratios, sometimes white box compression gives great results, sometimes not, but the point is that it's never worse than black box. And it creates compressed vegetation potential. Now, there are a lot of things that can be done in the future starting with compressed execution. I showed some opportunities, but I didn't actually test how fast is the compression and decompression with or without compressed execution. I just implemented compression and decompression to validate the results, the size, and then to validate that I can reconstruct the data back, but it's not efficient. So we would need to implement, an, to, to implement uh, efficient operators for each uh, node in the compression tree so that it performs well and it does not incur an overhead. Then the compression trees are fairly large. We could try to optimize them in the same way that we optimize uh, query plans, like shrink, or see patterns, see rules, yeah. that we can combine some nodes. Um, and then we may use a different cost model. The cost model that I use is optimized for size. We need to optimize for size and query execution time. And also add the complexity of the tree, of the compression tree as a factor there. And why not? Since this is the trend, we can try to apply machine learning techniques <laughs> to learn better the patterns in the data. Thank you. Does anyone have a question? Excellent presentation. Thanks. Uh, but this is your future PhD work now, what you're describing here? Uh, <laughs> not sure if I want to do a PhD. <laughs> I'll decide later. <laughs> but then if I will do, I will do this. <laughs> you will do that? Probably. Okay. It's interesting. Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because the approach is well done. Uh, but we already did that a, par a couple of years ago. Ten years ago, I gave my students the task, uh, we have to optimize um, query logs, uh, tick, uh, this, um, web logs. And web logs have the uh, nice, interesting aspect that's full of strings called URLs. And URLs is the very natural way you can cut it off in actually its components. Yeah. And uh, Lefteris even worked on that. So we had a module in MonetDB actually which stores actually URLs as a number of columns up to 250, 56, but it was more than enough, in which each of them had actually a particular part of the URL. And knowing that, of course, the, uh, the tail is unique, everything in between is perfect for, for compression kind of stuff. Yeah. And that also actually leads then to all kinds of interesting questions. If you're now going to do an, um, a pattern match, where do you start in these columns to do the pattern match? And how quickly can I actually pull things together to reconstruct the, the original URL? Yeah. These are challenges. Uh, it's still in the attic of MonetDB, and we've moved it uh, aside. 
but it's in the same in the, in, in, in the same structure that you you can break it down. Uh, also, by the time you know the compression tree, it's very easy because it's nothing more than a materialized column. So you define a view over a table in which one column is an expression, and expressions are your operators, and that's it. And it can, can be integrated with yeah. that. It's fully really integrated that. No, I mean the white box compression can be an extension of the, that. The white box compression is nothing more than actually replace this column by actually a, 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 a compressed column, which actually is defined by these two operators with this operator tree. Okay. And then actually it would pass through the whole pipeline of optimization steps as well. Where to start? So there, there are more opportunities than you might think. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah. yeah, one question. How far are you actually from one column to the information theoretic boundary? I know you're not necessarily bound by this boundary thanks to the decomposition of compression. I'm in the process of creating a theoretical baseline that will evaluate the best way that we can store, that we can represent columns in terms of the black box compression. Um, methods, but I didn't do uh, like uh, an estimate estimation from the information uh, theory perspective. So I don't know that. But I, I think but XF is pretty close to the to that. Like if you do XF with maximum compression, that's quite close. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But does that also hold for multi column, like like the co column correlation? Maybe if you store it, depends on how you store PDT, I guess. No, 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 it's, no, no, it is no, no, unlikely no, 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 because it can be like that a, a pattern yeah. which is a digit actually correlates with whatever is string. Of course. Yes, and yes, these yes. methods are typically based yeah, on hash table matching. Yes. No, actually, so they will not look like each other. Except we'll probably be able to catch that because the way it works, it constructs a machine that predicts your data, um, a stochastic machine that predicts your data. So I think. It's actually, in a way, it's similar to the white box compression. So I, 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 predict, I would assume that it would catch this. Okay. If you, for example, if you start at row major, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, row major. Yeah. If you would go to the CSV, you would say. Yeah, yeah. could be done. I'm gonna try it at least and <laughs> see how far, how, how well it's that goes. That. Yeah. Okay. It's I'll try that. easier than trying to figure out the theoretic graph, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to have a lower bound so yeah. stock as well. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but now you can also apply it to a timestamp. Right. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, a timestamp you can also break down. You don't have to stop with strings. Oh, yes. It's, uh, you can take any pattern, actually. But, but you already prefer timestamps to an actual proper type where from string to. Th that's an so option. No, no, but even, even if you take the timestamp internal representation, mm -hmm. you can split it. You can split it. Oh, fair enough. And that's what we do in one of the optimizers. We, we know that it's a timestamp, so you can do a kind of calendar compression where you actually can take, actually, you untangle uh, the timestamp in its components. Mm -hmm. And that really helps. Yeah, this happens actually because of the character set split. This is how timestamps yes. get compressed yes. Yeah, yes. in my implementation. Yeah, and so. So in the time in the calendar compression in the mosaic, you will be able to tell, but we do it. But uh, I mean, this is going to be interesting because Diego was is working on the, well making uh, fast, the fast implementation of this. So one interesting uh, direction might be to um, entangle them in digits um, because one operation that needs to be very quick is bringing the column back. You know, so. Because if the optimization doesn't apply, you actually have to produce the original values. Yep. And otherwise, I mean, if you store like a string, a numerical string, as a number, that's great for compression. But you would need a lot of divisions in order to bring the the, the digits back. So the, the idea there would be to use four-bit digits. Uh, so then you are in the middle of the road, kind of. You have an understanding of the structure of the data, but you have a very very quick path towards bringing the digits back. Uh, yeah, just as a thought experiment. So if I now take uh, if I take a table and I use the CSV representation and I create a table as create table uh, row string, right? Okay. Uh, and I, I throw that into the white box compression method. It should, in theory, be able to actually um, yeah reconstruct the, the schema in a way just to 
to store that entire row uh, as an expression tree, basically, of you know, the concatenation of all those uh, individual components. Depends so on the learning algorithm. But that one might be yeah. a, nice, a nice challenge for the learning algorithm, actually, to say, okay, here, the zip bar, it, there is structure in here, you should probably be able to, not you, but yeah. the method yeah, should be able to find that. Yeah, the recursive exhaustive algorithm will surely split everything into really small parts and then co correlate it back. Exactly. The iterative w algorithm will not work that well. Okay. But that's a great observation. It could be a nice uh, result. Yeah, it's, it's also you know, nice to show me. Like, hey, yeah. Schema, who cares? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but there, there are lots of these hor horrible CSV files with lots of errors yeah, that's that now that people do by hand. Yeah, but that's a bit of a different problem, I would think. I mean, that's exceptions then, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, but no, no, no. parsing them is hard. But well, we had Till's work for that, so we kind of looked at that, you know, trying to make human files regular again. And after Till, you can then apply this again. Yeah. <laughs> I think in the interest of time, uh, we might yeah. well yeah. want to go Maybe we should uh, start your presentation then. Uh, also, I think. Thank, Thank you, Bogdan.